Hi, I'm Laura Matson of Sandia National Laboratories. And I'm Shelley Ledger. I like thinking about all kinds of binary analysis and the internal information that automated binary analyses often compute and discard, like value set analysis information. I can use that information to do things like contextualize and understand the results of the full analysis, to debug the analysis, to judge the confidence that I ought to have in its results, or even to use as evidence when I'm presenting the results of the analysis to somebody else. So what I want to do is build a system that externalizes that information and presents it to me and to other reverse engineers. But wait a minute there, is that wise? From the cognition perspective, adding extra information could potentially be confusing, especially if it's imperfect. We don't want to overload people with information that they aren't actually going to use. Maybe we should do a little study to figure this out. We could look at accuracy and timing information with perfect and imperfect information to see if exposing that information helps reverse engineering in a small context. We could also record eye tracking data to determine whether people are actually using the information we provide and whether it helps uh, their reasoning or changes their reasoning process as they work through code problems. Neat. Yeah, let's do that. So that's what we did. We conducted an experiment that was reviewed and approved by the Human Studies Board at Sandia National Laboratories. To run this experiment, we developed code problems that met certain requirements. So first of all, the entire problem had to fit on one screen with no scrolling to allow for collection of eye tracking data. Next, the problems had to be simple enough that people could complete numerous variants of each problem type within an hour. This was done to minimize the impact of fatigue and also to allow for generalization. If we have people do multiple variants, we know that our results are not driven by the features of one or two specific problems. So we made a lot of simplifications to meet these requirements but that allowed us to really control our code snippets and get rid of some of the uncertainties associated with real binaries, focusing on memory modeling. We handcrafted 24 distinct, simple code snippets. They were information flow problems, moving public and sensitive data through memory. Each required memory modeling and a little bit of conditional reasoning to answer the questions. All were written in basic C, reflecting effectively decompiled code, though potentially reverse engineered. Each used only pointers and integers. Integers could be a public value, a sensitive value, or an arbitrary integer. We did not use any arithmetic. Each problem allocated memory and moved values using only dereferences, assignments, and conditionals, and then printed a memory location at the end. Of the 24 problems, eight always printed sensitive information, eight sometimes did, and eight never did. We had 12 easier problems and 12 that we intended to be more difficult. And then of the 24 problems, we broke them down into four problem types, inspired by flow, path, field, and call site sensitivity analyses. We note, however, that we don't claim any formal flow sensitive, path sensitive, field sensitive, or call site sensitive analyses. Rather, these problems are simply named to reflect the inspiration for the problems. Each problem was paired with some type of VSA information. And we note here that the VSA information in these simple problems effectively devolves to points to information with public or sensitive values in memory. So the three types of VSA information included none, which is effectively just the code, no model associated, or precise VSA information, which is the code and a memory model that shows exactly which values can be printed and no more or imprecise VSA information, which is sound and over approximate. So the memory model doesn't distinguish between whether public or sensitive information will be printed. Again, it's overly general. So let's take a look at an example. This is a path expired, inspired problem that always prints sensitive information. It consists of two conditional sources where the value that is stored into an address is uh, different between the conditionals, but the destination, the place where it is stored is the same. So let's take a look at this example. If month is one, sensitive is stored into Marianne and birthday girl becomes Marianne and we print Marianne. Otherwise, sensitive is stored into Jennifer. Jennifer becomes the, the birthday girl and we print sensitive again. So we see that we always print sensitive information. Taking a look at the VSA information, birthday girl in both cases always points to mem3 because it's allocated and never assigned. 
But if we look at what MEM3 points to, in the precise VSA information, MEM3 points only to sensitive, as if a path-sensitive analysis had been run. In the imprecise VSA information, MEM3 points to both public and sensitive, as if a path-insensitive analysis had been run. For flow-sensitive inspired problems, the imprecise VSA information is a memory model that disregards instruction ordering. For field and call site inspired problems, we refer you to our paper or our released material. But we remind you again that we do not have any formal analyses, formal sensitivities of analyses here. These are just inspired by the sensitivities. So here are what the completed stimuli looked like to our participants. The code was shown on the left half of the screen and the VSA information when available was on the right. A fixation point in the center of the screen was where people looked at the start of each trial, calibrating the eye tracking data. And the response choices were at the bottom here. So when people were ready to answer, they clicked on one of these three buttons. The stimuli were fully counterbalanced. So every one of the 24 problems was paired with the no VSA information condition and the precise and imprecise conditions. Across participants, they, each problem appeared in each of these conditions equally often. And we also counterbalanced the ordering of our blocks of stimuli so that we could eliminate any effects of learning or fatigue that could impact performance over the course of the experiment. For our data collection, participants sat about 60 centimeters from the computer screen, and we used a standard Bovio eye tracker to record their eye movements. The participant completed a short training session explaining the experiment and the VSA types, and then they analyzed the code problems, taking breaks between blocks. Most participants completed the task within about 45 minutes. For people who aren't familiar with eye tracking, this right here is what one of our eye trackers looks like. It uses an infrared camera to track the position of the eye, and it translates that into screen coordinates, which are taken every five milliseconds. So here's an example of the eye tracking data from one trial. The person started on our fixation point in the middle of the screen, and then each dot represents one of the samples from the eye tracker. So you can see how people's attention unfolds over time as they reason through these problems. Our participants were 20 Sandia employees, 11 of whom were very experienced in this domain. So these folks had eight to 20 years of experience with C and similar languages. They had experience with answering questions about information leakage, reverse engineering, and pointer analysis. We also had nine less experienced participants who had two to five years of experience with C and little or no experience with, ANTS with the areas listed above. So once we collected the data, then we start to analyze it. First, I'll talk about our behavioral data analysis. So our first question is whether our stimuli perform as intended. So the problems are intended to have two levels of difficulty, easier and more difficult. We also thought that the different types of problems should differ in difficulty. So the call site, field, flow, and path problems. However, the different answer types, always, sometimes, and never, should not differ in difficulty. So our first question was, was our stimulus design successful? So these plots show the average proportion correct and the average response time in seconds for our easier and more difficult problems. We found that our manipulation worked as intended, so participants had a higher average accuracy and a faster response time for the easier problems relative to the more difficult problems. When looking at the four different problem types, we found that the flow problems were the easiest with the fastest, uh, highest accuracy and fastest response times. Uh, path problems were somewhat more difficult, followed by field and call site problems. Finally, we did not want our stimuli to differ in difficulty based on what the correct answer was, and we found that that was the case. Um, there was not a significant difference in accuracy or response time for our different correct answers. You'll note that there was a numerically higher uh, accuracy for the sometimes problems, we noted that people tended to respond sometimes when they were unsure about the answer. So in future research, we plan to include unsure as a response option as well. So these initial analyses confirm that our stimulus design was successful. So now we can compare the different types of VSA information in terms of their overall performance and, look at and also look at interactions 
between VSA type and problem difficulty, and between VSA type and problem type. So we call it every problem type, the easy and difficult problems, and the call site field flow and path, and path problems all appeared equally often with each type of VSA information. Okay, so for our first comparison, looking at the overall comparison of the different VSA types, we found that VSA information type had a significant impact on the participants' accuracy and response times. Their performance was best when they had precise VSA information, both in terms of highest overall accuracy and lowest response times. However, having imprecise information also improved participants' performance relative to having no VSA information at all. However, there was a speed accuracy trade-off where having that imprecise information also slowed people down. So now we want to look at interactions between VSA information and problem difficulty. Here we found significant interactions between VSA information type and problem difficulty for both accuracy and response times. Without VSA information, people had much lower accuracy and longer response times for the more difficult problems relative to the easier problems. Adding imprecise VSA information eliminated the accuracy difference between easy and difficult problems, but the response time difference remained. Adding the precise VSA information again eliminated the accuracy difference, and it nearly eliminated the response time difference as well. Now we'll look at the interaction between VSA information and problem type. Again, we found significant interactions between VSA information type and problem type, looking at both accuracy and response times. So when there is no VSA information or, precise VS or imprecise VSA information, the accuracy and response times differed across problem types. Again, we found that the call site and the field problems were the hardest and the flow problems were the easiest. And we see this pattern in both the response times and the accuracy. Adding precise VSA information eliminated the differences between the problem types. So participants performed equally well in terms of accuracy, and they were equally fast in their response times. Finally, we looked at the impact of experience. We found that there was a significant interaction between VSA information type and experience level. When there was no VSA information, the more experienced participants had overall higher accuracy than the less experienced participants. When VSA information was added, whether imprecise or precise, the difference between the two groups was eliminated. So to summarize our behavioral results, participants perform best with precise VSA information as we predicted. This precise information was particularly beneficial for the more difficult problems. It eliminated accuracy differences between easier and more difficult problems and between easier and more difficult problem types. It also greatly reduced differences in response times between the easier and more difficult problems and eliminated them when comparing across the four problem types. However, con contrary to our predictions, imprecise VSA information was also helpful. It improved the accuracy of the less experienced participants in particular. However, it also slowed people down relative to having no VSA information at all. So we found a speed accuracy trade-off for the imprecise information. So our question for the eye tracking analysis then is, do different types of VSA information change the participants' reasoning strategies? So for the eye tracking data analysis, we had 15 participants in this analysis, eight more experienced and seven less experienced. Uh, the other participants were excluded because of a technical problem with the data collected from the eye tracker. The eye tracking data was used to calculate fixations. So fixations are time periods where the eye pauses to take in information. Saccades so uh, are ballistic eye movements that occur between fixations, and people are functionally blind during saccades. So fixations are the only part of visual information processing where the brain actually takes in information. So those are what we identify in the eye tracking data. To analyze this data, we define regions of interest on the screen. So we have a general region for the code and for the VSA information, and then subregions within those uh, to break down our analysis in more detail. So beginning with our overall comparison of the VSA types, we found that the VSA information type had a significant impact on where the participants looked as measured by the proportion of fixations to the code versus the VSA region. When there was no VSA info available, people did not look at that region, which is a good thing, there was nothing to see there. 
when the imprecise VSA information was presented, people did look at it, but they spent much more time looking at the code. When precise VSA information was available, the distribution of fixations was more balanced. When we looked at, at the same information broken down by difficulty, we see similar patterns for both the easier and more difficult problems, with a slight trend toward people looking at the model, the VSA information more, when the problems were more difficult. Next, we looked at the impact of VSA information on strategy. So for each participant, we looked at the average time between trial onset and first fixation in three key regions of interest. So recall people start the trial by looking at this fix fixation cross, and then we're looking at how long on average it takes them to look at the start ROI, the print ROI down here, and the VSA information ROI. So this gives us a general sense of their strategy. Are they looking to the code first? Which way are they working through the code? Or are they looking to the VSA information first? When there was no VSA information available, we found that three of the most experienced participants always started with the print ROI and worked their way upwards through the code before answering the question. The rest of the participants, including all of the less experienced participants, tended to start at the top of the code and work their way downwards, like in a traditional reading task, top to bottom. When imprecise VSA information was added, there were four participants who started by looking at that information, then looked to the print statement and worked their way upwards through the code. Another two of the most experienced participants started from the print ROI, worked their way upwards through the code, and then looked at the VSA information last. Seven participants, most of the less experienced participants, started at the top with the start ROI, looked at the VSA information, and then looked back to the code, working their way back downwards to the print information. So they essentially started from the top, looked back and forth as they worked their way through the code, and ended with the print statement. Another two of the less experienced participants had unique patterns that didn't fit in any of these other categories. When there was precise VSA information available, the patterns changed again. So this time we had seven participants who started with the VSA information, then looked to the print ROI and work their way upwards to the code. Note that this group includes two of the less experienced participants who we never observed working their way upwards through the code in any of the other conditions. We had another four participants who started with the VSA information then went to the start uh, ROI and worked their way downwards. We had three participants who worked back and forth between the two, starting with the start ROI, looking to the VSA information, back and forth as they worked their way down. And finally, we had one less experienced participant who worked all the way from start to print before looking at the VSA information. Another analysis we did was looking at those more detailed ROIs within the code ROI. And here we found an interesting pattern where for the flow and field problems, the pattern of proportion of fixations to the different ROIs was roughly the same, uh, no matter what type of VSA information was available. We see fewer fixations to the code overall um, for the imprecise VSA information and precise VSA information, but the pattern of this distribution is the same. However, for the path and call site problems, we see a slight difference. So when there was no VSA information or imprecise information, we see a higher proportion of fixations to the conditional source regions of interest relative to the conditional destinations. We see that for both the path and call site problems. And in both, that pattern reverses when we added precise VSA information. So this indicates that the presence of the precise VSA information did change people's strategies about how to reason through these code problems, including changing the relative importance of different regions, different specific information within the code. So just to summarize our findings, we found that providing precise VSA information improved participant speed and accuracy, while providing imprecise VSA information improved accuracy relative to having no VSA information, but it slowed people down. Having VSA information provide the, provided the biggest benefit for harder problems and for less experienced participants. The eye tracking data showed that participants did use that VSA information and that they relied on the precise information more, especially for the harder problems. 
The VSA information also changed which parts of the code people looked at. For example, spending less time looking at the conditional source and more time looking at the conditional destination. Finally, our results indicate that having VSA information made the less experienced people look a bit more like the experienced folks. It helped them to reach similar levels of accuracy. And we also observed that the less experienced people were more likely to adopt strategies for reasoning through the code that were similar to those of the experienced people when the VSA information was available to them. So in conclusion, our findings show that aiming for more precision in VSA information is useful for reverse engineers, and also that full precision is not necessary for improving reverse engineers accuracy. However, imprecise information does slow people down. So in situations that are limited by the reverse engineer's time, having imprecise information might be more detrimental than helpful. It will take some future research to try to track down the different situations in which imprecise information is helpful rather than detrimental. But with this experiment, we hope we've laid the groundwork for future research along those lines. Thank you very much for your attention.